like the, uh, uh, the, the warm-up show tonight. We've got a couple of things on the agenda that we want to talk about because some people have asked for them and inquired about them, and I've said we're going to talk about them, so we're going to talk about a couple of things, and then we're going to spend the majority of our time in the debate. I'm sure a lot of people are here because of the debate, and it's uh, definitely something that I've been excited about. Uh, let me start off with a quotation real quick, okay? It's from Thomas Jefferson, because I always try to read from those people of that time. And he says, this is kind of, it, this is kind of like uh, paraphrasing it, but he says, Enlighten the people. That is, give them knowledge, give them knowledge, uh, education, educate, enlighten the people. And tyranny, he says, will vanish like evil spirits at the dawn of day. I think that's a great quote, because in essence, if we can just show people what's involved, regular people can get together and look at legislation that affects regular people like me and you. And that's going to help us to make wiser decisions, then in the long run, tyranny vanishes. You know, society is freer and everybody is happy. So that's kind of the, the thing that we're looking at with this particular discussion, not just tonight, but in all of them, is for us to enlighten the people, for just, again, for regular folks to get together talk about things that actually do affect us, I believe, actually do affect us as people that live in this state. So we're going to have fun tonight. We are going to have a debate. Let me say just a couple of things, first of all, about the Article 5 debate. Uh, let's not uh, talk about the Article 5 debate before the debate, is what, I, is what I want to say. Just to say it, you know, let's leave that to the debaters. We're going to talk about political compromise. That's the first thing we're going to talk about. And that might naturally lead somebody into saying, well, how does Article 5 fit into this idea of political compromise? If they want to address that when they get to the debate, we'll let them do it. But let's try to stay away from that and let them do it. We'll have the opportunity to ask questions. And also, let's not put them on the spot to answer questions about other things that we're talking about. Because I've said all along, we don't want to bias anybody against our debaters unnecessarily, you know. We didn't ask these guys to come here to talk about, say, for instance, uh, their take on political compromise or their take on House Bill 1828 or whatever it may be. If they want to, if y'all want to jump in and say whatever you want, that's fine. But at the same time, uh, let's don't ask them to get involved in another conversation that might, that might, that might just uh, not be good for the debate, okay? So, our agenda is to talk about compromise, then it's to talk about House Bill 1828, and uh, Boomer has a timer on me, it's only going to be for a few minutes, and then we're going to get to the, deb the debate after that. Alright? One other thing. Uh, I want to let everybody know there's not been some disagreement, or not disagreement, that's totally wrong, there's been some misunderstanding, perhaps, of the relationship of this organization, the Oklahoma Legislative Review, and the Carter County Republican Party. And so what we have done to make sure that everything is just neat, clean, and this will really just apply mostly to the people that are part of the Carter County Republican Party, but to make everything neat and clean, make sure that we're paying our fair share and that kind of thing, we have decided to, and we already have in fact with the Oklahoma Ethics Board, created uh, the Oklahoma Legislative Review as its own organization. Uh, David Plesher, we haven't ironed out all the details yet, but he's agreed to come on and help out with uh, uh, the treasurer's work. And so, uh, uh, you know, we're looking forward to some, some good things in the future. And having said that, we do have to pay our own way. Uh, and uh, so I brought a bucket. And if, now I want to say, we always say these events are free. It's a mayonnaise. <laughs> See, we, 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 this is conservative right here, folks. You want to know what conservative is? That's what it is. Uh, anyway, uh, we have to we have to keep the lights on. We're paying for this facility, and the reason we're paying for it because I believe this should be and is on its way to becoming the hub of political education in Carter County, as the party, as uh, groups like ours coming in here, or in other groups perhaps. Uh, I just believe it's a great place to make uh, to meet. So we do have to pay the bills, and uh, we've got you know different things. So if you can help out, you don't have to. And if after it goes around, if you'll give it to Dave, since he's going to be the keeper of the money, we're going to give it to him. Is that okay? Yes. Can you wait and see how good the debate is? Yeah. <laughs> we'll leave it at the exit over there. <laughs> Just in case I'd give now. No, you have to pay up front. Sorry. All right. 
let's let's uh, let's talk about political compromise. You know, as many of you know, I uh, have 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 a religious background. I was a full-time minister for many, many years of my life, and uh, I still enjoy that kind of thing. Of course, I still enjoy speaking, but in the religious background of mine, my idea was that pretty much compromise isn't really a good thing. I don't know if you can relate to me in your religious background, your, your belief about the Bible, but our belief about the Bible was Right there in the Bible. So you don't have any compromise with that. That was the philosophy that we had. And a lot of people are like that. You don't compromise. If the Bible says it, you, you don't compromise that. Uh, same thing, morals. You don't compromise your morals, right? It's, not, it's never a good thing for a person to compromise their morals. It's not good for you. It's not good for your relationship. It's just not good all the way around. So when we come into the political realm, we think the same thing, don't we? Uh, there are certain things that actually do make a difference in a person's life. There are certain things, like let's say abortion, the right to life, that, that sacred right to life. To me, anyway, that's not something I would compromise on. When, you know, I believe in the right to life, and I would be against abortion regardless. We all have our lines that we draw. We all have our lines of compromise. But I guess the question really is where exactly, when it comes to legislation, where exactly do we draw the line? Uh, I maintain that everybody eventually draws a line somewhere on everything. I used to get in religious discussions with folks sometimes and they say, well, we, we don't draw lines. And I said, well, yeah, you do draw lines. You just may not draw your line where I do, but everybody draws their line somewhere. Uh, I mean, I don't know how anybody could live life if they didn't draw some kind of line over which they won't step, you know. So, uh, Everybody's got to compromise. But, of course, the kind of compromise we're talking about is uh, political compromise. When exactly is it okay for a person to compromise in regards <coughs> to their political philosophy? Now, over here on the board, I have, let's see, I have what I would call, or what I've come up with, that I call the liberty meter. Now, I'm not, I'm not a grand kind of guy that can come up with... Uh, uh, you know, kind of catchy things, but this to me is kind of a simplified way of if you take a bill, any given bill, and by the way, a lot of them, I'm sure these guys can tell us that know a lot about it, there's there's hundreds of them, probably thousands of them that, that, that aren't really going to be affected by this so much, but we're talking about the key bills that, you know, get into a person's life or that regulate, that... Uh, that burden citizens and things like those are the kind of bills that, that I'm interested in looking at when it comes to political compromise. So I have what I what I have termed here uh, the liberty the liberty meter. Very simple. It's like a uh, what do you call that? An ohm meter, a, an electric meter. You hook up and see if the juice is on. It's kind of like that in a sense. And what you do is you run a bill through this liberty meter. And wherever it finds itself, if it finds itself on the positive side of the meter, then that bill would be good to go. If it finds itself wanting or on the negative side of it, then you better think pretty you know, clearly or pretty hard about whether you want to be a part of something like that. And what I mean basically, sometimes people when they hear the word liberty, you know, uh, it's kind of like some other words. We hear words like conservative, liberty, libertarian, uh, liberal. And we hear a lot of these words and we don't really know exactly what a person means by them. So what I mean, let me just say what I mean by this, is anything that's on the positive side of the liberty meter, you can call self-regulation. Any bill that puts it in the positive side is either going to promote or somehow uphold self-regulation. Now the reason I termed it self-regulation rather than self-government is because the flip side of that, the opposite side of that is, oops, nope, it's not self. It's state or government regulation. See what I'm saying? Really, when it comes to a bill, and you run it through something like this, you know, all you have to do is ask, does it promote the idea of a person being able to regulate their own life or an industry being able to regulate itself? Or... Does it promote the idea of the state regulating an industry or a person's life? So all these bills that we look at, like for instance the uh, 
the bill on the nutrition and the diet, remember that from last month I think it was? When you look at that bill, you can say, okay, what does it do? Well, it transfers individual responsibility for health and diet from what? It transfers that regulation from self to the state, doesn't it? And so, for me, anyway, when you look at a bill like that, that takes that power away from the individual and gives it to the government, that's the kind of bill that I personally wouldn't want to compromise on. So, I think anything, you run it through something like that, and you can make some pretty good decisions. Comments? Do you agree with that? Does that sound like I'm on the right track with that? I like it. Anything at all? Sounds good. I know you're waiting for the Your printings need to be a lot bigger if they're going to read it in the back, but... Oh. This is self-regulation. State regulation. Yeah, you're right. You should make it a bell curve, so it's a liberty bell. There you go. You know, you, you know something could be developed to really kind of kernelize the idea, I think. One more thing quickly on this is the idea of uh, limited government versus a growing government. Some people would say, well, you can also see if a bill is good or not, in part by does it grow government or does it shrink government or does it do neither. It might, it might, it might not really do anything at all. But if it does one of the two, that's another good way to look at it. However, really, even the growth of government can fit into this if you think about it. Because usually when government grows, liberty shrinks. Amen. That's the truth, isn't it? I mean, it's just a natural tendency, like with, again, the dietitians' bill. When they were going to transfer the uh, governing authority from self-regulation to state regulation, they, it, they grew the government, or they would have grown the government had that passed, and they also would have reduced liberty. So growth of government and the reduction of liberty, they seem to always, or almost always, go hand in hand. So, you look at it that way, and I really think that can settle a lot of questions for us. Okay. Any, any, other, any additional comments on that? Because I do want to keep the House Bill 1828 before we go further. But if there's anything at all, feel free to jump right in there. All right, let's go to House Bill 1828. Now, I passed this out right here to everybody. Uh... And what this is, is this, on the very first page, this is a history of House Bill 1828. This particular bill, and by the way, this isn't updated here. I printed this out, actually, I don't remember the date. But since then, two days after I printed it out, I believe, there were some updates on the bill. Let me explain the bill to you real quick. Yes? Where's page two of two? There is no page. That was my printer. or I just printed the first page of it. I think the bottom of it would have been, the, you know, like the bottom of a web page or something like that. I don't, I don't think it was anything important. But basically what the bill was going to do in a nutshell is this. Currently, in Oklahoma, certain industries are already regulated, like to be an electrician, to be a plumber, and that kind of thing. They're already in a, a regulated industry. This bill, what it was attempting to do was it was attempting to also include what they call in the bill, builders and contractors, which is we'll look about in a minute. That's pretty broad. Builders and contractors is pretty broad when you look at their definitions. And in essence, it would have taken everybody from, let's say, a, a home builder that builds 100 homes a month. I don't know if that's a large number or not, but say from a big home builder all the way down to the guy that, you know, like I used to do a lot of, but all he does is he goes around and he repairs cracks he textures walls, he paints, he may do a $1,000 job, he may do a $1,200 job. That person in the smallest of construction industries would also be affected by this particular bill. And so that's why, like I said, I, you know, I think we need to look at uh, re uh, regular people looking at regular bills, and this for sure is a bill that affects regular people. Uh, you're in the construction industry. I have been in the construction industry. Uh, you've done some of that, haven't you? Uh, I'm just a contractor. You're, you're just, uh, you, you, better not, you better check this out, man. You might have to be paying for this. Uh, really and truly, uh, I mean, if you look at the definitions of what's involved with this, and you may indeed fall into this, and it, you actually would have to uh, follow the rules of the state. Uh, I'm happy to say that as of right now, 
uh, this is this is old, but as of right now, the bill is dead. What happened was, just to give it to you in a nutshell, in the house, they had a vote on it. And this is, and we're not going to have time to look at this. Take this home and study it, though, because this is really a good example of a bill going through the process uh, and finally getting to where it is today. What happened was the bill failed initially in the house. If you look on there at the third reading, it failed 34 to 47. Then, though, there was a motion made, and I don't know all the ins and outs of all this. Certainly there are a lot of people here that know a lot more than me. But then a motion was made to reconsider it. So the bill was voted down, but then the author said, well, let's reconsider it. And they voted, it says, to reconsider it. 60 to 10, I believe it was. Yeah. And after they voted to reconsider it, then they did what's called, it's right about here on that sheet, title stricken. You see that phrase right there? When you strike the title on a bill, they can vote on the bill, but the bill can't become law. Does that make sense? Uh, no. <laughs> if they take, say, this bill, I've got a copy of the bill here, which, by the way, is 17 pages long. That's why I didn't give everybody a copy of it. If they take this bill and they, and they say, okay, we're going to vote on this bill, but first we're going to take the title off. We're going to strike the title. If they do that, then if you vote yes on it, it still can't become law. Every legislator can say yes once the title is stricken, but it still can't become law. And so what happens is they all say, okay, well, let's strike the title. So they do, and then a lot of legislators feel comfortable in going ahead, proceeding with a vote to say, okay, we'll go ahead and vote yes on it to keep it alive, which essentially that's what it does. You say, well, why would they even do that? The reason is because if... They, if they did not strike the title and, and they had voted on it and it was voted down, the bill would die. It would just go away. So by the fact that they struck the title and then voted yes on it means the bill lives on. It, may, it can't become law yet. They're going to have to come back to it and put the title back on it or whatever they do, but it, 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 uh, it enables it to live on. Uh, However, what happened, and this is not on this last part. Let me go ahead and put it up here. I'm skipping through a lot of this so we can go, so we can get through with my part here. But this is what's not on your part that I handed out. Uh-oh. Uh, these, last, these last few things right here. If you notice, what happened was... Uh, sorry, thank you. Uh, where it says H, that's, that's in the House, and where it says S, those are things that have happened in the Senate. You'll notice over here that, first of all, when it came over to the Senate, the enacting clause was stricken. That's another thing that's required for a bill to become law. So by the fact that, the, that the very first, one of the very first things that happened was they struck the enacting clause meant pretty much the bill was probably in trouble. I don't know for sure if that's what it meant, but that's what it sounded like to me. But then, eventually, on the 22nd, after I printed what I gave you, the measure failed, 8 to 37. So, uh, for now anyway, it's, it's dead. Uh, so, that's a, that's a good thing in my opinion. Not everybody may agree with it, but uh, as you look at the bill, I think you can see why, at least, why at least I hold the opinion that it's not a good bill. Anything, uh, any comments before I go on to the bill itself real quick here? How did our representatives and senators? Okay, uh, I can say, let me say this, let me, let me be fair. They're, they're, this, of course, was voting on a bill that did have the title stricken. So it is a case where even people that did vote for it were not technically voting for a bill that would become law. See, um, I don't know, some people may call them the tricks of the trade. I don't know what's all involved. I need to research it more. But essentially, a lot, a lot of times they feel more comfortable voting on it once the title has been stricken or the enacting clause has been taken off, because like I said, it can't become law. But to me, this, this, is, this is where I'm at on it right now. To me, voting on a bill that's as bad as this bill, as we're going to look at, is like voting to keep a rattlesnake around as long as it's in the box. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like... If you bring a rattlesnake over to my house in a box and you say, hey, let's keep this thing around because it's in the box, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, man, no. 
<laughs> let's, let's get that thing to, to chop right now. Let's get rid of it. And that's how I feel about a, a super duper can't be rescued bill like House Bill 1828. Some bills you just have to vote them down whether, whether they're actually going to become a law or not. So anyway, that's my take on that. Uh, all right, so real quickly, because I've got about five minutes here, and then we're going to turn it over to the big, the big boys. Let's look at some parts of this bill. I hope you can see this. So I, I want you to see how, at least in my opinion, this is not a very good bill. 17 pages, most of it is new law. Some of it is uh, just amending, but most of it is new law. Let me grab my sheet here. Where is that? So I can know what, what I want to point out on page 5 here. First of all, on page 2 of this bill, it, it uses the word regulate. When I hear the word regulate, I'm like, uh, that's already just put me way down there in the negative side of the liberty meter, you know? So when we come up to page five right here real quick, here's what we find. This is section three of the new law. Look right here at the definition of a builder or a contractor. Builder or a contractor means a person. That's me. I'm a person. That means a person engaged in the practice or business of construction, remodeling, or building a residential, retail, or commercial building in this state. So, it, it applies to new home builders, of course. They build 100 homes a month. But it also applies to remodelers. Do you know how broad that word is? Mm -hmm. It is. I mean, if I go in and, and I contract with you in your house to paint your wall, that's a remodel. Or hang a shower curtain. Yeah, technically, if you really want to get technical, it is. That would be considered reminding me. But government right. doesn't get technical, so we're safe on that. Oh, yeah, we, we're definitely safe Sarah's on that. Look at, look, at, look at number five. We don't have time to look at all of them. But look at number five. It defines a residential, retail, or commercial building. You say, I don't know why if I'm over here in this guy's house over here. Well, number five says that a residential or commercial building means any building in this state. So here am I, here I, here I am, this lowly builder, got one guy, all we do is go fix cracks and do drywall and paint and that kind of stuff. This applies to me. There's no way a person can say that doesn't apply because it does. It applies to all of them. Uh, notice at the very bottom of this, this is another one of those words here. This Registration Act shall exercise the following powers and duties. When we start giving powers to the government, you know, uh, we, we should start listening. Uh, if you read down through this, we don't have time, uh, but it talks about how it gives them the power to make rules and regulations, gives them the power to establish a study of curriculum. All I want to do is, is, is tape and, and, and fix some some walls and paint, and all of a sudden I've got to go to college? Yeah, that's, that's what it's saying. You've got to go to college. Actually, it says to employ staff in order to carry out the provisions of this act. In other words, they can hire a team, to government growth, so on and so forth. Then, real quickly down to page 9, section 6. More new law here. Part A. No person, again, I'm, I'm a person. No person shall engage in or practice building or construction or hold himself or herself out as a contractor or a builder. You can skip, I mean, you can read all that, but, and then it comes down to the unless part right here. In other words, you cannot even say you're a builder. Somebody says, are you a builder? Uh, no. You better not say you're a builder if you're not certified according to this, because if you do, you're going to find out in a minute you're a criminal if you even say you're a builder. Okay? Unless he is, here's the word of unless, unless he or she is registered in accordance with the provisions of the Oklahoma Professional Residential and Commercial Builders Registration Act. So, don't you be doing no building until you get registered with these folks right here. Now look, look at this right here. Lindell, if you go up and you say you're a builder, if you say, I'm a builder, and you're not a builder, 
such mis misrepresentation upon conviction shall constitute a misdemeanor and shall be punishable as provided in this law. That to me is just crazy that literally in one just big grasp they're taking in a whole industry, like I said, it really affects real people like me and you. Real people are affected by this. I wonder, once you're at that point and you've now done that misdemeanor, can you now carry your gun? Did you just lose your your, your Second Amendment rights over a title? Well, uh, that could be, man. I don't really know the answer to that question. I'm just going to quickly go through some of the other things here. Uh, continuing education, nine hours of continuing education. Uh, and uh, if you don't renew on time, you get your whole thing stripped away and you've got to go to the back of the line and start all over again and get re-registered. Would that preclude you painting your own house? Uh, you know, I, I watched the video debate on that in the House, and that question was asked, and he said no. But I don't. I have not found in here where it actually says this does not include painting. Because uh, probably you say, well, you're not holding yourself out to be a builder. I don't know, I'm sure. Uh, anyway, a minimum of a million dollars of liability. That's hard for a lot of guys that just go out there and, and all they do is paint and fix walls. Believe me, I've, I've carried a million dollars a year, and it's expensive. Uh, if you have a contract over $500, has to be written. You can just walk over here to this lady. She says, how much you paint my wall for? $600. Okay, go do it. Now, I would do a written contract in my business, but now it's the law. You can't just say, hey, handshake, go do it. It's the law now. Uh, and on and on it goes. One more thing, and then we're done. Page 15 of the bill. Because this really, or no, it's not actually 15. That's the best one. one minute. John, you, you do have me curious on this. I see there's a committee substitute. Yes. Down there, a second bottom line. Is that what you're showing, or is that the the one that was introduced? This is the floor version, the House of Representatives floor version. It says, well, oh, you don't have a copy of it. What I have here is the floor version. Okay, so you, you're not looking at the committee substitute who was presented in the Senate. Uh, the Senate one, if you look at it, the only difference in it is, I believe, the striking of the uh, enacting clause. And okay. this is the one that passed the House and eventually, uh, you know, had these titles stricken and was... was yeah, I'm kind of curious in this because, you see, if Representative Moore voted against it on the, the in the House, and then on, on March 10th, if I'm reading this right, and then the very next day, he became a co-author as it moves over to the Senate, right? Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering, obviously, he had reason to. Something changed or whatever. And I'm curious if he knew the a committee substitute was coming. You don't want to know, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I said we don't want these guys. We don't want y'all to have to weigh in on it. But well, I'm just clarification. I was yeah, just hoping I, I don't you might really know. You don't know. answer that right offhand. But uh, yeah, what I'm looking at though is the floor. A lot of times board. when the title's off, they probably told Lewis that we're going to do this. Yeah. Right. Put it. I know several things that were promised was one, get rid of remodel, get rid of the million dollars, and require a floor of a million dollars. Which is what they were supposedly trying to protect. So, right. Yeah, but and that's why it died is because none of those promises were made, but they were still promises. Yeah, and, and like I said, I kind of figured. Well, we don't have it up here anymore. But when it, all, when it had the enacting clause right off of the bat, that it was probably in some trouble at that point. Time's up. Let me just throw up. I'm going to cheat just for se page 16. <laughs> the first time you get busted, $500. The second time you get busted for saying you're a builder and you're not a thousand, the last time twenty five hundred, and each day, each day, if they want to, if they want to sink you because they don't like you, each day is a separate offense. So you say, I'll just go right back out to work because I have to. Well, then they can just keep on finding. Did any of our guys vote for that? Oh, I'm sorry. I was, yeah, was going to get to that. Uh, um, Simpson did not vote for it. He voted against it. So I'm proud to say that. Uh, uh, Senator Simpson did not vote for that. And in the House, uh, Owen did not. I'm sorry? Hardin voted for it on several occasions. Owen voted against it once and was conveniently excused for the rest of the race. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Hardin uh, voted for it. Oh, really? Okay. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, you can you can yeah, study so those. Look on the Internet. That's, what, that's where the information is. If you don't get on the Internet, you need to. 
uh, it really has. Thank you, Al Gore. <laughs> Thank you, Al Gore. Amen to that. <laughs> okay, so that's the end of my part. Uh, let's get on with the, the most exciting part. Let's get on with our debate if you want to get everything set up or whatever. Go ahead. We're going to be more strict with y'all. When the time is up, you get to finish your sentence. Or shoot, that's right. Yeah, uh, yeah. He uh, told me I'm not allowed to. <laughs> I'm so excited about this. Really, this just kind of, kind of came together on a, just uh, right around the time we went to the convention, and I saw that people were getting real excited about this. If you if you get on Facebook and you look at some of the, the trending things, say like on the Oklahoma Constitution Facebook page, there were like 200 comments on the Article 5 question, uh, uh, and you know I just didn't have time to even, I just had to quit reading them because there were so many comments on there. Uh, it's an exciting question, and uh, did you, oh, I'm just suggesting the overhead projector be taken down. Yeah, absolutely, good idea. Uh, so I'm excited about this. We have some other ideas in the works. People, uh, we've talked about, you know, having some other debates, maybe one in the fall on a hot topic, and uh, because I think this is really a great way to learn is just to fairly represent both sides of an issue. I mean. You can't get better than this, you know, uh, because, you know, both guys are here. They're passionate about what they believe, and maybe you haven't even studied the issue, so this is a great opportunity. I'm going to read the debate rules very quickly because, and the reason I'm going to read them is because of rule number one, which is these rules shall be read before the start of the debate. <laughs> <laughs> number two is the proposition. I'm not going to comment, by the way. I have not revealed my position publicly on this question. I, I don't think I have anyway. I really thought, and I just can't. If I have, I don't remember ever doing it. And I've told two people in private about what my position was, and uh, but that's it. And the reason for that is because I did want this to be as as you know strictly just objective as possible, totally objective as possible. So the proposition is as follows: Should the Oklahoma legislature apply to Congress for an Article Five convention to propose amendments to the U.S. Constitution? Senator Rob Sandridge is going to affirm that yes, we should. And uh, Bob Donna, Donahue, is that uh, he is going to be in the negative on that, and I'm going to be the moderator of the discussion. Uh, this, I, I don't think, we've got a small crowd tonight. Everybody looks friendly and happy tonight. But there shall be no noise or other demonstrations from the audience while the debaters are speaking. You know, none of, none of this or that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, except for applause at the end of a speech, spectators are asked to remain quiet unless uh, asked to speak by the moderator. Time. Uh, Boomer's going to be our timekeeper. The order of the debate will be as follows. The first affirmative by Senator Standards will be for 11 minutes. Then uh, first negative will be 11 minutes by Bob. Then we'll have the second affirmative uh, for four minutes and the second negative for four minutes. Then we will have a period of questions from the audience. Um, I, have plan I have planned to do written questions, and the way we have put it down here, I'll just read it, but uh, the way we plan the questions is, if you have a question, uh, well, where is it? questions will be asked by the audience and submitted in writing to the moderator by the end of the second negation. That is, by the time Bob is through with his second speech, I'll give everybody one of these, and if you want to write a question down, you can. Submit it to us, and then we're going to try to submit those questions to them in alternating order. Then we're going to do that for approximately 15 minutes, and then we're going to have a one-minute appeal from uh, uh, S Senator Standridge, and then one-minute appeal from uh, Mr. Donnan. Okay? One-minute final appeal. So, are there any questions about where we're going with all of this? Question. Yes, ma'am. Um, if you're the moderator, do you have someone who, when you, you get all the submissions of questions, who's consolidating the questions, or are you going to do that as you go? Well, what I'm going to, what I figured I would do, and if there, this is the first time I've ever done this, so uh, give everybody a question. Oh, yes, we did that. <laughs> I was going to hand, just hand everybody a piece of paper, and if you have a question. When you, go, when you go ahead and have your question in between speeches or something, just hold up your hand and I'll come and get it from you. If it's a question, 
specifically for one of the debaters, write, you know, uh, for Bob, and then write the question, and then we will address it to him, and then the other will have a chance to respond to it. If it's a question, just a general question about Article 5, uh, then, um, then just, just write the question, and we're going to try to alternate back and forth so everybody has a chance to speak first and second. Does that, does that sound okay? Sound like it'll work? Okay. Well, without anything else, then, we are going to ask uh, Senator Rob to come up and give his first speech. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. And by the way, you did a fantastic job at the convention. I uh, was moved by your speech and uh, enjoyed it. And uh, am very satisfied with the end results of our new chairman. Uh, Senator Brogdon is a friend of mine, and I admire him greatly, and I think he's going to be a great leader for the party. Looking forward to that. Uh, so, my name is Rob Standards. I'm a senator from Norman. Uh, I'm a citizen legislator uh, by every definition of the word, have absolutely no desire for politics until I felt compelled to run. So why did I run? I ran because I had three kids, I had two at the time, and uh, the, I felt like the nation is just going in the wrong direction. I, I think we're in a cultural decline, a fiscal decline, and frankly I'm not sure how to get out of it. But that's why I ran. I, I want to make this nation do everything I can in my power to preserve the greatest nation on the planet for my kids and grandkids and your kids and grandkids. So that's my mission. Uh, the subject we're talking about today, Article 5, Convention of States, is a way that I see to get there. So I'll talk about that and how I got to where I'm at. Um, first off, I don't, uh, I'm very honored to be named uh, legislator run of the year with the, with the conservative index two years in a row, but I'm not, I'm honored by that, but I did not run to be labeled. I have several legislator of the year awards and they're in my drawer at home. I don't hang those on the wall. That's not what I'm there. I don't say things that people want to hear. That's not what I do. That's not how I was successful in business. That's not how I've gotten to where I'm at. I look at and evaluate everything I'm doing and I try to try to sow a path to where I want to end up and where I think the nation wants to end up. So how did I get here? Well, you talk about the Constitution. This is the greatest document of governance the world has ever known. And is it perfect? No. We've had amended. Uh, the ladies here, thank goodness we did, so you can vote, you can hold office. Um, we've amended it to remove slavery. We've done things to change it, adjust it along the way. In fact, the Bill of Rights, we talked about Article 5, was essentially an ex post facto Article 5 convention because those, those Bill of Rights amendments, all 12 of them, were sent into Congress by the states and then sent back out on a promise that they would be ratified later. But the Supreme Court has, has taken over, as you all know. So, so where it got me to where I was a big fan of nullification and position. I'm not discounting it completely. But when you start looking at nullification, it was the word nullification is very interesting. It was only mentioned in a draft copy of the Kentucky Resolutions. Anybody here familiar with Alien Sedition Acts? The, those were some acts that anybody read those, like you were reading other bill. I mean, the Alien Sedition Acts makes that look like Child play. I mean, those things are so unconstitutional, it's unbelievable. So, so Thomas Jefferson called, used the word nullification, but in the final adopted resolution, the word wasn't used. And in fact, even when you look in, in the version that it was used, it's really only in the grievances. The solution is talking about appealing to Congress by the states to repeal those acts. And there's no talk in there of, of ignoring those, those acts. And could we use nullification? This is the things that I've come to, conclusions I've come to. Could we nullify a Supreme Court ruling on, on gay marriage, traditional marriage, Sharia law, Obamacare? Well, we tried, and it hasn't worked. So we passed the most powerful nullification statement I could ever make, is I put it on a piece of paper and you vote for it. We've done that three times. All three times have been overturned, and not an executive branch since the Civil War is going to flaunt a federal, has flaunted a federal court ruling of substance. And it won't happen. Well, I, I don't believe it will ever happen. In, in conversations with Tom Woods, a, a book I enjoy, by the way, Nullification. I think Jim gave me a copy or told me to read it, one or, one or the other. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's a great book. However, Tom told me on two different occasions that nullification is just the statement. So all I can do is make the statement. I don't carry it out. The second floor, the executive branch, does uses the mode of what's called interposition to carry out the nullification. And like I said, since the Civil War, executive branch doesn't have the cojones to do that. They will not do it, not in any type of concerted effort. It just won't happen. And we've seen that with the three 
uh, constitutional amendments in Oklahoma I've mentioned. So what do we do? Well, in response to the Alien Sedition Acts, when it was discovered that Thomas Jefferson wrote the Kentucky Resolutions, which wasn't discovered until about 1819, 1820, this is what Thomas Jefferson had to say about it. He said the state convention procedure based on Article 5 was the better way to resolve disputes about the balance of state and federal power. He said that in relation to the Alien Sedition Acts, horrific acts that imprisoned people for condemning or for uh, criticizing John Adams, the president at the time. James Madison was a big proponent of Article 5 throughout his life. Notwithstanding a letter that some opponents will, will list you the first sentence in, but I'll read you the whole letter here in a minute. Uh, but James Madison, this is an echo of everything he said with regards to Article 5. Should the provisions of the Constitution, as here reviewed, be found not to secure the government and rights of the states against usurpations and abuses on the part of the U.S.? Is that not going on? That is going on. The final resort within the purview of the Constitution lies an amendment of the Constitution by the states. This is not an isolated. This is his opinion throughout his life. In fact, he wrote a whole treatise on nullifications about 30 pages long, 25, 30 pages long, when people started trying to use nullification to mean what it didn't mean in those resolutions. Alexis de Tocqueville, on his opinion on nullification, one of the most respected historians of the founding era, said it is manifest that such a doctrine would destroy the federal bond and principle and in fact restore the anarchy from, the, from which the Constitution delivered us. And this is a similar sentiment. I could read you some much more harsh words by James Madison and Thomas Jefferson on the, on the topic, but I won't because I still believe there is some place for it. So what can Article 5 do? Well, we can have amendments to fix the Supreme Court, balance the budget, solidify states' rights, uh, fix the commerce welfare, welfare clauses. Uh, who are some of the people behind this? I know I get criticized for mentioning your names, but when you line up, line up history, names are mentioned. So when you think about who's on which side, I'm not trying to be critical of the opponents. I respect them greatly. I think they do a lot of service for the state. Uh, but when you think about who's on the side of this and who's against it, we have to think about that. This is a few names. I'll mention a few more. I could mention a lot more than those. Uh, so in the debate on the, on the Senate floor, one of my good friends, Senator Mike Mazie from Tulsa, who's probably the most financial genius in the Capitol, uh, I don't think any legislator would argue that fact with me. He mentioned about fearing drags. I don't mean this in a negative way, with all due respect to the opposition. I mean that he describes them, I describe a lot of these opposition pieces as things that that the John Birch Society never never talked about. A lot of the other people, uh, courageous leaders throughout time, never talked about these. Here's a little bit of John Birch Society timeline. Robert Welch was a proponent of Article 5, the founder of John Birch Society. Larry McDonald, the greatest hero of the John Birch Society, was a proponent of Article 5. In fact, we talked about protection of human life. I am pro-life. I hear every pro-life bill that, meeting that I chair. Uh, Unfortunately, tens of millions of babies are dead today because of a Supreme Court justice by the name of Warren Burger that started a fear campaign, campaign to end an Article 5 movement by Larry McDonald called the Protection of Human Life Amendment. He had gotten it to 21 states. Warren Burger stopped it dead in its tracks by telling conservatives that we may not be able to control the convention. I think that's unconscionable when I look back. Uh, Here's it reiterating that point that if we had not had that fear campaign by Warren Burger, who I don't mind criticizing for that because he's the leftist most activist judge in U.S. history, in my opinion. Somebody said Taney might be worse. I, I, I defer. Maybe he's worse. But this guy's definitely in the top five. Not a conservative by any stretch of the imagination. So here's some of the thoughts. George Soros backs a group called Wolfpack. Don't deny it. Uh, he also backed a group in Montana called Montana Budget and Policy Center that fought against Article 5, Balanced Budget Amendment in Montana, and won this year. And he directly contributes to that group, and they send letters out to legislators to ask the opposition why they should fear a uh, convention. So he's on both sides of this. And, and to say that we can't use a portion of the Constitution because our enemy wants to use it would be like telling me I can't use the First Amendment to profess my faith in Christ on the floor of the Senate. I would do that every day even though my enemies may use it to criticize. Second Amendment, Vermont, arguably the most bluest state, bluest state in the nation, has constitutional carry. Not even they would ratify anything for telling Second Amendment rights. 38 states much, must ratify. Apportionment, this is one that uh, my good friend Steve Weiss told me this is his main problem, is the fear of apportionment. Um, I've got several things I can get to, such as when our states call legislative sessions. So, what an Article 5 convention is, is a legislative se session among 50 states. And our governor in Oklahoma has the power to call a special legislative session. 
but she has no power to set the rules. And even though she, she can actually even convene a special session, but yet she has no power to do the rules. Article 5 is for the states, by the states. It is left to the states intentionally because the states are the one that, ones that wrote the language. So it's up to the states to set the rules and convene the convention as they did in all the multi-state conventions leading up to the Constitutional Convention. Unintended consequences, don't want to go too deep. This is a real concern. I validate this as something we need to look at carefully. Just like when I author a pro-life piece of legislation or I hear one, what are the unintended consequences? Sometimes we have to be courageous enough to say, you know what, we have to move carefully and cautiously, realizing that maybe we may not do perfect, but we need to do the best we can in pushing back against the federal government. Overly divided uh, alien sedition acts, that would be akin to saying if somebody criticized Bush and WMDs, they'd go to prison. That would have been Civil War 10 years ago. But yet, in Alien Sedition Acts, Jefferson and Madison recommended Article 5. The Madison letter, I don't have time with the time coming to read the whole thing, but the opposition will pick out the one time Madison ever said anything negative about a convention. He was talking specifically about the Constitutional Convention and a nation on fiscal, on the brink of bankruptcy, he said, we do not have time to reconvene. And if you read the rest of the letter, it tells you exactly why we couldn't afford to reconvene. I think it's very important to read everything in context, not pick out and choose just those words that try to bolster your side of the story. So anyway, I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm committed to pushing back on tyranny. Tyranny is not won in a day, a week, a year, or ten years. So I'll fight for it as long as I have breath. Thank you so much. Returns. Oh, sure. sure. John, thank you very much. I appreciate all everybody here having us out for uh, this whole discussion. You know, the um, Senator Sanders brings out the idea of history and what was done before. Frankly, I like to talk about what's going on today and how we're handling these things today, because I see that as very relevant. For example, <clears throat> let's talk about the rules. Okay, the rules for a convention. Really rather interesting. How many of y'all have gone to, uh, let's say, the Oklahoma GOP State Convention? All right. You know, when you go there, you ever wonder about the rules and how much influence they have on things? All right. How they get used? How about the National Convention? You ever wonder? You know, what's going on sometimes? You see, the reality is, he who controls the rules controls the convention. They control the results. They have the greatest amount of influence on it. And that is, that's really the angle I'm coming from, folks, when you get right down to it. <clears throat> For example, at our state capitol, let me give you a summary of the rules, so to speak, that our legislators kind of have to live with. They go, th sure there's a formal process, majority vote in both chambers signed by the governor. We, we all get that. We all get that. But what about the informal part? What about even the rules that are made in the past? Okay. The whole idea that, you know, the first thing we do is we elect the leadership of the uh, chamber, and of course, he appoints, if I got this right, he appoints various committee chairs in the whole bit. Now, if you want to get your bill to be heard in committee, because one of the rules is committee chair can just not hear your bill. All right, and just kind of put it in the bottom drawer. So what happens is, if you want to get your bill heard in committee just to get a vote on it, you know, don't you think it makes sense to vote for the committee chair's bills? See, so all of a sudden you get this sort of give and take going on because there's power through the rules invested in a few. And the many have to figure out how to, how to work on through that. You know, when you see a bill and it's signed by the, uh, the, uh, the president pro tem of the Senate or the Speaker of the House, you're going to want to kind of lean into that if you want to get your bill through. Because any one of them can just bury it. This is the nature of the rules, and that's what's going on. Now, for a convention, should we have a national convention? <clears throat> our state representatives understand this. Our, our state legislators, I should say. If you take a look here, this year, there were nine resolutions and bills, there they are, okay, actually prepared by our <clears throat> state legislators. A few of them. A few of these have actual proposed resolutions in it. But you know what the vast majority of this text is? The rules for a convention. 
Oklahoma legislators would like to reach through the Article 5 process to set the rules for a convention. All right? <clears throat> they understand. He who sets the rules controls the results. Now, on the other hand, Congress understands this too. They have their own paid research service called the Congressional Research Service, and they put out a report. This one's a year ago. I don't think they've updated it since, and I haven't heard. All right? And it talks about an Article 5 convention. Okay, what's going on? And, and in the middle of all this, they basically say, Senate, House, you guys can set the rules. And in fact, the, um, if you go through here, back in the 70s and 80s, the last time we came the closest to having a convention, 32 states had applied. We would look like we were getting close. Congress began to crank up the, uh, the press, so to speak, and get some rules together. They actually had some bills floating through the initiated 41, pretty well evenly divided between the two chambers, okay? And they were to set the rules for a convention. Now, <clears throat> so let's say they go all the way through and they pass, all right, or whatever, which is, because none of them have, you know, in Oklahoma anyway, at least not at the federal level, right? Let's say they do. How do you decide who wins? Because they do contradict each other at points, okay? How do you decide who wins? Who decides who wins? Supreme Court? Supreme Court? Right? Isn't that where something like this would end up? Great. Do you want to trust the Supreme Court when it comes to dealing with the issue of a constitutional convention? I don't. You see, that's a great unknown. This is where all the risks come in. All right? The, um, in addition, this year, <clears throat> Senator Standridge authored a resolution and a bill. The resolution is the application of a convention. The bill here is to set rules, okay? And governing even our own delegate or delegates should they go to a convention. For example, it'd be a misdemeanor if they violated their instructions. Well, kind of cool. If they're guilty of a misdemeanor, they can be recalled. If they don't get recalled, they can be arrested and brought back for trial, so to speak, right? And then another delegate can win. Here's the resolution. <clears throat> it's a way of the state kind of making sure they get their wish. Here's the problem. This year, the bill, it passed the Rules Committee, and then it went no further. And all you had was a resolution. Resolution goes over to the House. <clears throat> of course, we inform our legislators, hey, your accountability is gone. <clears throat> this still moves forward. This is not the first year this kind of thing happens where the accountability gets dropped but the application stays in place. There's a pattern already created. Fortunately, our House had the wisdom. <clears throat> when they finally put the title and the enacting clause back on, and they were no longer being generous because they knew it was kind of not the real vote, it went back on and they shut it down, 42 to 56. It happened this last week. Now, the bill's still alive because they actually rescinded the third reading, which means <clears throat> they kind of pretend like that vote didn't occur so they can bring it up again next year. Is really the intent behind the whole thing. So now, um, <clears throat> here's, here's the issue, though, dealing with reality, okay? When you're dealing with this whole question of the state setting rules, Congress setting rules, and the special interests right now that have so much influence over Congress, the East Coast establishment, all those groups and everything that give us such grief because they harvest our liberties and turn them into profits is what they do. Right? They're going to reach, I would predict, they would reach right through Congress and do the same thing with the convention. That's the risk. That's the risk, folks. <clears throat> and the states don't have the ability to counter that. Okay? It's all right here. Are we going to trust that to the Supreme Court? The risks are high. Let me tell you something else. <clears throat> About 45% of the state's budget is federally funded. So who has control over who? L let's face it. Who's got control over who? Until we get underneath that knot, get out from underneath that juggernaut, we got a problem. Nationwide, about, uh, the states, on average, about a third of their budget comes from federal government. We actually exceed the average. It's a problem. There's something else, too. 
You know, delegate selection. Okay. Oklahoma, <clears throat> comes time to select the delegates. Remember the power of the leadership that I just brought out before? You want to get your bills passed, you better keep leadership happy. They have their bills, and you know them, because they author them, right? So you got that little thing going on back and forth, all right? Well, a lot of the power relies, right, resides in the leadership. Think about it. President Pro Tem, okay? See this right here? This document right here, <clears throat> go look at the website. It is his, uh, his donors, his PAC donors. Imagine corporate PAC donors. You read them off here. You see who they are. Healthcare industry, construction, energy, all these various PACs contributing tens of thousands and tens of thousands of dollars to his campaign. Okay? Let me ask you something. Who do you think he's going to pick? How do you think he's going to influence the process? When these folks realize that a convention is real, that it's going to come around, do you think they're going to remember? Hey, Senator, I give you five grand. I give you two and a half grand. Um, you know who I think would be great as a delegate? By the way, do you have career ambitions? This is the real world today. That's what I'm bringing out. This is the real world today. This is the risk of having a convention. As long as we are so beholden, as long as our elected officials and our state government is so beholden to all these special interests, they have a major hand, folks. George Washington, <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson aside. Who is the influence today? John. Thank you, Bob. Um, well, I know Bob's main contention is, is the rules, and, and I and I understand that. I, I I disagree, but I'd like to talk through that with you for, for just a minute. One is, I think everybody's agreed here that we need to do something, right? That, I think when you look down through the Declaration of Independence and you read those grievances, I bet you would it would be familiar with you today that what the federal government is doing. So when they send their officers to harass us and to manage the state, micromanage the state, you talk about your tax dollars, they do come back here from the federal government with lots of strings on them. We can do nothing about that until we put the federal government back in the place as the child. Right now, we are the child. That is not how the founders intended it. It is not how the Constitution intended it, and that's why we need to repeal the 17th Amendment, we need to have a balanced budget, and we need to have term limits to put the federal government back in the place as a child. Until we do something against the federal government, all we're doing is just wasting air, in my opinion, with all due respect. We're not doing anything. And with regards to the rules, you talk about all the bills they propose, not even Congress, who definitely wants to control this, not from the perspective of special interests. They want to control it to kill it, absolutely. Why would they not? In fact, I've already heard indirectly from Lucas and Cole that they are concerned that we might actually have one because now we're to 27 states, two in the last month. Oklahoma is not one of them, unfortunately. Uh, but the 41 bills he talked about, here's what the Supreme Court has said time and time again, the last time in 1952. When the, when the Congress fails to adopt or pass a bill, they describe it as Congress has refused to adopt that method. It actually makes it weaker. And I guarantee you, Congress would never have the gumption to try to pass a law to control this convention. They would never do it. Uh, another thing is, he usually mentions Dillon versus Gloss, is what you usually mention. I was surprised you didn't mention that Supreme Court decision, because that's one of the very few that talked about uh, Article V convention. And what Dillon Gloss actually says is that if the founders during the Constitutional Convention or the ratifying conventions did not express an opinion about something with regards to Article 5, then Congress may have some power. So the only thing that they actually made a decision on, Dylan Gloss, that went outside anything within Article 5, was that there would be a natural deadline for amendments, for ratification. I think the, the year was seven years, if I remember correctly. Well, that has been vacated to, by the states, because the, does anybody know when the 27th Amendment was passed? And proposed, well, it was proposed as one of the original Bill of Rights and it was passed in 1993, which vacated the only substantive decision in Dillon Gloss. 
But the substantive part is that if Congress, or I mean, if the Constitutional Convention or the founders or the ratifying conventions made an opinion, which they did, by the way, Thomas Jefferson or Alexander Hamilton, certainly no states' rights guy, in Federalist 85 said that Congress shall call a convention, nothing in this particular is left to the discretion of the body. None of the multi state conventions, 32 of them leading up to the Constitutional Convention, including the Constitutional Convention, Congress never had a role. Never had a role at all. And they would not, because this is a state's convention for the states. And if states don't stand up and do something, then we're done. I know trust is a hard issue. I know I'm a state representative. I'm in there now. I was out and distrustful just like you before. But we're the last line of defense. If we don't do it, if you will not allow us to try to push back against the federal government, my opinion is we're toast. I, I sincerely believe that in all of my heart. And if we do not do something, we sit back in fear of dragons raised by the most activist Supreme Court judge in U.S. history, we're toast. I mean, this is the guy responsible for killing tens of millions of babies, and we're going to put him on the, on the side with us? That doesn't make any sense to me. Let's reevaluate where this fear came from. Let's reevaluate it, clean the slate empty, and rethink it like Larry McDonald, Ron Paul, Rand Paul, and Robert Welch, and those people did before all of this fear campaign began. That's what I would ask you to do is reevaluate without that. All right, okay, let's talk about solutions. This is the funnest part when you get right down to it. We have several solutions, and they're great, just so you know. The, uh, the difficulty with the Constitution and Convention is that the only, the only end result of that is we modify a document. We're not following it now and to a large extent in so many different areas. So we modify it again, where are we going? Nullification definitely has its place, but it requires strong states, okay? And we don't have strong states right now. There was a senator, state senator I went to a couple of years ago with a bill on nullification, and he said, Bob, my constituents won't back me up. His voters. What do you do? Now, by the way, the state has actually passed a nullification law. You might want to consider the Real ID Act, Senator. The author was Randy Brogdon, the year was 2008. The state, or the, the federal government, kind of sent an Instagram, so to speak, but that's all they did. Now, the, um, beyond that, let's talk about the real solution. And please send the paperwork out. The real solution is buried in here. <clears throat> I actually encourage and train folks to become activists, okay? Citizens become an activist. And part of the process of that training is something we call the power of 500. 500 citizens engaged in the uh, process somewhere or another become the single most influential factor in determining who their next congressman is going to be. That's the power of an engaged citizenry. They even trump a lot of money, all the media buys, that the, the heavy-end donors want to contribute because they're buying, you know, they're, they're carving away their liberties for the sake of money. The volunteers even trump all of that. I want to break that down. If you want to take a look, I'll look two minutes. Let's take a look at our state senate. Let's say you take, you have uh, 500 people at the congressional level. That's 50 at a state senate, 25 at a state house. And you come along now, and let's say each one of these people, let's say you had a popular state house, 25 people. All right. Now they went to 100 primary voters in their neighborhood. Who are they? I'll give you the list for free, folks. I got it. Okay, I'll give it to you. 100 primary voters, and once a quarter, they drop a little pamphlet, let's say, on their door talking about liberty. And you leave your name and address on there, okay, is what goes on. How many of those households do you have to move? Of those 100, how many do you have to move so that in the 2014 election, the runner-up takes first place? Well, all you got to do is take the margin, cut it in half, and add one, right? I know it's very simplistic in that sense, but it's explained here in this document. Rather academic, too. I realize it's going to be a little heavier in reality, right? What would the margin be? Well, let's take the first one. Joseph Silk, open primary. Of 100 households, how many would those people need to have switch their votes? The answer is 1.1. 1 1.1. 1. 1. Roger Thompson, 1.5. You know junk mail rates for conversion, so to speak? 2%. Because it's 100 household, these are percentages. Okay. You can do better than that. 
Folks, if you run on down here for an open house or for an open seat, the percentage you need to move is in, in lower single digits. For an incumbent in a primary, it's the higher single digits out of 100. We can do that. We just need to reach out to our friends and neighbors. We can restore a nation. We're actually that close. I'll get into more of it later if you want. <clears throat> then, when we're engaged, notification will begin to work because we're behind our people. All right? We'll get the right people elected. Local level going to federal, and a constitutional convention will not even be necessary. Why? Because the problem is not our constitution. Any more questions anybody wants to submit before we ask these guys to answer for us? Okay, we're going, we, uh, we have a time limit, of course, so we may not get to all of the questions, thank you, and, but uh, we'll ask as many of them as we can. We're going to try to do them in alternating order as much as we possibly can. Okay, now the rules on this, of course, are uh, one minute per question for each of the speakers, and uh, I'm just going to call on one, and like I said, we're going to try to go back and forth if we can, so... Uh, Senator Standridge, this one, first one will be for you. Uh, on your chart, Senator Standridge. Uh, it's not my chart, by the way. I, I don't even know if I've read it. Oh. <laughs> uh, it reads, it is an accepted fact that Congress has only the authority to call the convention. He says it says that on my chart. Where does Article 5 state this limitation? Um, good question. Excellent question. Kind of goes to what I was talking about a minute ago. Well, um, the beauty part of Article 5 is if you could put yourself in 1787, I think it would, it would, it's a lot easier to understand because when George Mason talked about why this amendment was needed, and it was in the Virginia plan as well, it was talking about how Congress was, it was, not appropriate for every amendment to have to go through the national legislature, which is what they called it at the time. And so George Mason and James Madison concurred that it would not be appropriate if Congress was involved in that decision. This, amend, this provision within Article 5 is specifically designed to circumvent Congress. I'll read Federal Lady 5 is just one example. It's echoed throughout in the, in the mention of sovereignty with regards to Article 5. Is with, and I would refer you to a, a, a Set of five volume set of books called the Founders Constitution, actually free online, that you can confirm all this. And I do not take things out of context, but I'll read Federal State 85 is long, but this section pretty much talks about how what the role Congress has. And it says, Congress shall call a convention. Nothing in this particular is left to the discretion of that body. Time. That is not my words. That's out of the Federalist Papers, and that's what the Supreme Court would refer to and Congress. Okay, okay notice what Senator Sandridge does is he, he refers back to precedents from 200 years ago. And yet, what I'm concerned about in the rulemaking process is what's going on today. For example, here's standard of standards corporate PAC donors. The whole list. Okay, it's right here. Tens of thousands of dollars in the last election. Okay? Who do you think is going to have the greatest influence, even over Senator of standards? Are you saying that I'm influenced by my donors? Excuse me, it's my God, yes. Yeah, that's, that's, wow, that's so, a slight. <laughs> So, there's a reason that, folks, we know the reality. We know the reality. Do I need to answer that question? Even if Senator Standridge is not, what about all the others? Now, with that said, Senator Standridge, how about, I'd like to ask you, you uh, not take corporate donations the next time around. How about at least corporate donations through PACs? from out of state. Would you agree not to take those? You have plenty of them in here. Okay, uh, next question is, uh, we'll start with you, Bob, this time. May a state rescind or withdraw its application? The, um, what happened in the 70s and 80s is uh, as the count got up to 32, all right, states did begin to rescind their applications. And uh, it seemed to be accepted by Congress because they, they ceased their activities to continue to pass laws. Even the Congressional Research Service says that basically Congress waned in their support for the whole thing. They lost interest, so they didn't go forward with it. So right now, a recent precedent, the last time it occurred, uh, the answer would be yes. And what happens in the future? Um, I don't know. I mean, what if people change their mind? You know, I mean, it's, it's not like we've had a convention before. 
you know, under Article 5? Um, I'll, I'll just, on the record, I have never personally attacked anybody on the opposition, and it seems to happen quite, quite often from the other side. Uh, but it, I'll tell you, if you want to enter into politics, they know you have no business in politics because the, the people you mentioned that you admire in office, all of those people have received money from PACs and individuals. I am not unique in that, and I don't receive anything at all with <laughs> thinking that that's going to affect my vote. I have no business being here. Fire me tomorrow if I would do that. I, I don't appreciate that insinuation. Uh, it, with regards to rescind, I've actually. Uh, committed uh, Senator Brogdon on recension at the time because at the time there was no momentum. And so I would not want to have uh, these resolutions, applications sitting there not knowing the time we're in. But today we have 69 of 99 legislature, legislative bodies in this nation controlled by Republicans. And whether you trust us or not, we are in a window of time similar to 1865. If we don't do it now, this window may be gone and we do not have the opportunity to do it again. Uh, so. Today is an opportunity. I put a seven-year sunset on the resolution that I proposed, both of them in the House and the Senate, because I think that window of time will disappear. And, and we will look back 20 or 30 Sorry. years from now and say, what did we do? Why didn't we follow the Constitution and the instructions our founders gave us to push back against a tyrannical federal government? That's the question we will need to answer for our kids and grandchildren. You guys are going to need to restrict your times. Okay, uh, next question. Um, so we started with Bob last time, so we'll start with yeah. this time. Uh, it appears that neither the Convention of the States or nullifications are doable or supported. Now what? What are each of your constructive solutions beyond the Convention of States and nullification? Thank you. E excellent question. The question that I asked myself before I got elected and every day since. So what I'm looking for as a successful business person is solutions. I've gone to national meetings of Assembly of State Legislatures, uh, around the nation. There's been up to 35 states of those. I do believe a convention of states is possible. I, I don't think it's our only option. I think it's doable. And those states that are represented there want a balanced budget, term limits, and repeal of the 17th Amendment. That is absolutely the only thing that's ever discussed in any venue that I've ever been in. Uh, now, there are some groups out there that want to do something different. That's their option. They can do that. I'm open to other suggestions. There's 27 states that have applied for this. We only need 34. We can get to 34 without Oklahoma. I would think that would be unfortunate. Uh, but we can, it'll probably get there without Oklahoma. So if you want to continue blocking, that's fine. But I think we ought to seriously be looking at our options. And I'm for nullification, but the constitutional amendments, there's nothing stronger than I can do. And all three have been overturned and are now nullified themselves. Time. Power 500 actually answered that question. It's us. We the people need to rise up and get engaged. It doesn't actually take a lot from where we're at when you get right down to it. Contact your neighbors. You know, I actually bring in dozens of people every year, a couple dozen people every year into this process, and I'm just one person alone actually doing this. This is very achievable. Reach out to your nature, your neighbors, get engaged enough to help to assist bills get passed or kill bad bills. Tell your neighbors your war stories about your success on that. They will be impressed that you know the system that John is teaching, and they'll want to join you and get engaged. If you just talk about the problems, your neighbor is going to trump you and ignore you. If you talk about the solution, they will get engaged. And until we get enough people engaged, these corporate PAC donors in the whole bit, they're going to trump. They're going to trump. By the way, talk to Representative Jason Murphy. He has won by the largest percentage margin on this sheet about corporate donations. Okay, uh, so this will be for you, Bob. Uh, and this question, some of these, this question was actually for the Senator, uh, Senator Standridge, but uh, because we want to make sure we alternate, who pays the delegate expenses to attend the convention? Oh, my turn. Yeah, you're going to you're going to lead with this if you don't mind. That's actually came to that point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is one of those details where the states may well want to pay, and then the Congress may well want to pay, and all that. And I haven't really gotten into a lot of that. It doesn't say in Article Five, so it's a matter of detail, as the Supreme Court calls it. Okay, in terms of how to actually work that out. Yeah, that's what their decision on the uh, Dillon versus Gloss and all that, because that's. That is something that has to be worked out, and I don't, I, don't, I don't claim to have the answer on that. Keep in mind, we haven't actually done it, have we? So a lot of these variables are unknown. 
But I'll tell you something. Back in the uh, back in the day, in 1787, we had the uh, Constitutional Convention then, and the state ratification conventions afterwards in the various states. Who paid the salaries and all, whether it be the counties or who are you know the cities and communities that sent the delegates, or the state did, actually had a bearing in the politics of the ratification at each state in terms of what's going on. Interesting read on the history. Manipulation wouldn't be unique to our day, folks. Excellent question. Excellent question. I, you know, it's up to the states. I personally don't think that we need a Delegate Limitation Act, which is the bill he described, but I offered one because I want people to be comfortable with the process. It is up to the state legislatures to do this. I took out reimbursement out of mine, as I do every bill that comes to my committee. I always strike any type of reimbursement out of it. I don't believe the state should be reimbursing citizens or legislators, for that matter. Um, the, uh, the question, though, is with the, when you look back in time and you look forward in time, what are we going to do? I mean, I don't mind the grassroots effort. I'll help. I'll volunteer. I'm for everything that can turn the, the federal government around. I was elected to do that, I feel. Every porch, every doorstep I knocked on said the same thing. And it's incumbent upon me, it's incumbent upon the states to stand up and, and use the power that we were given. If we don't do this, if you will never trust us enough, I guarantee it. We're human, we're fallen too. If we're going to wait till the perfect world arise, arises, it will never come. So we have to do something. It's incumbent upon us to do this, do something. And I promise you, I assure you that I will keep fighting. So this question will be for you now. Uh, why do you continue with your resolution once your penalties bill was not ever heard? Ah, good question. Again, I don't necessarily believe that we need a DLA because of the penalties bill, but I support it to make constituents more comfortable. But there's no reason running that until we do the resolution. I have assured everybody that I, it's not dead, it's laid on the table. I will bring that up as soon as we pass a resolution. There's no sense passing that and causing more confusion about that before we pass the resolution. But of course we should pass a DLA. 18 states have passed one that have called Article 5 conventions to make their people feel more comfortable. But the trust level, will, we will never be perfect enough, I promise you. you weren't, we weren't when I was outside and I, they're not when I'm in there. But unless we do something, I think our days are numbered. $18.5 trillion dollars in debt and counting faster than you can possibly imagine. If we do not do something now in this window of time, we only have ourselves to blame. And when we look back in time and wonder what we did and we did nothing, only we are to blame for that. Only we are accountable. And this window of time will not go on forever. Thank you. You know, the whole issue of penalties, the, the reality is Congress, one of the uh, laws they proposed back in the 70s and 80s was a Supreme Court decision. So let me ask you something. What do you think will happen, even if we do get a balanced budget amendment? Excellent question. I mean, uh, I will agree with Bob on one, one score. Uh, Congress will never pass an amendment or send an amendment out for ratification that will curtail their own power, ever. The founders said so. Uh, everybody since then has said so. Ronald Reagan said so. That's why he supported Article 5. Most recently, Senator Mike Lee from Utah, probably the most conservative senator in the U.S. Senate, proposed a balanced budget amendment to be ratified that would go through the process in January 2013. It never got a hearing. He has said it's up to the people, as Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, and many others that you probably have a high regard for. They realize that unless we do it as states and people, we're not perfect. I'm fallen just like you. You will never trust me enough. We will never have a perfect scenario. Uh, but if we do not stand up and do something, we will have failed our children and grandchildren. And, and to do so under irrational fears is not appropriate. There are certainly real concerns, but we really need to look at this from a blank slate and quit listening to Warren Burger and other people like that that have got us into such a tizzy over something that the founders intended us to use in this very circumstance. All right, thank you guys, appreciate that a lot. All right, so uh, we're gonna have a one minute final appeal by each of them, and uh, then after that we will be done. Stick around and ask some more questions, or like I said, were some questions we didn't get answered tonight. But uh, we appreciate y'all being here so much, guys. Uh, uh, it is a tough question. As you can see, there's a lot of passion on both sides of it. But I'm happy that now you have the information and you can go study it. And we, we're, we're better equipped to make our own decisions. So uh, 
Rob, if you'd like to give your final appeal now. Sure, absolutely. Well, once again, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's, uh, it's lovely riding down here in the rain because we need lots of rain. So thank you, God, for delivering us some liquid sunshine. Uh, but this is, a, this is an important issue. This is not something that we should take lightly at all. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, not suggesting that. Uh, but what we have upon us today is a decision to make going forward. Uh, tyranny wasn't conquered in a day. I don't care if this takes my entire life. I will not stop battling against Washington, D.C. because that is the problem. It's not the people there. It's the system that has been created over the last five to ten decades. And the 17th Amendment must be repealed to give power back to the states. A balanced budget amendment will help. Is it a cure-all? Absolutely not. But the most important thing is states must rise up. And so uh, this Constitution, this Convention of States under Article 5 is, to me, in my heart, is more about states rising up because we're getting beaten down in every other way. We're getting to a number now that is making Congress nervous, I promise you. And if we got to 34, they'd be shaking in their shoes, and they'd be coming to talk to us about what the heck are you guys starting to do over there. So states need to be the parents again, not the children. Thank you so much. Thank you. The reality is we the people need to rise up. We need to reach out to our neighbors and our friends and get them engaged. Until then, regardless of the mechanism that's chosen, if we're asleep, the mouse is going to steal the cheese. It doesn't matter which mechanism you choose. It's just the reality. We have no choice. That is really our only and best option is to get our neighbors engaged, come out to groups like this. This room should be double, double think of the topic. This room should be filled to a maximum and should be in a different hall. This is just a reflection of we the people. Now, Senator Standridge, I believe to be a noble gentleman. I like Senator Standridge. Outside of this measure, he has a very, very good voting record. But you know something? Those corporate donors, they're a matter of public record. They're there for us to see for a reason. We ought to think critically about the influences on each one of us and how we'd respond. <clears throat> I'm actually worried about the leadership of our various chambers. What would the leadership at the federal level do? Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you, uh, thank you for being here next month, the last Monday of the month at 7 o'clock. Uh, I don't know what it will be in May, right off the top of my head, but Lord willing, that's when we'll meet again. So I hope you'll join us for that. And uh, appreciate again these guys joining us. <laughs>